I guarantee you, not one contract exists that you have ever signed, starting from the point of you knowing that it either affects you positively or negatively, or you were just aloof. Up till this point, where you're beginning to learn about trust law, which is on one side, and contract law, which is another side, there's two pillars that hold up a house. Not one type of contract that you have ever signed at school, at work, or a lawyer, so-and-so, none of those contracts you have ever signed failed to have novation or assignment clause within them. The past few videos on the Truth of Lending Act, you hear us speak about assignment. So I trust at this point you know, at least have a general idea of what an assignment is. We read the definition, we gave the functional example of it how it works and how it's actually a contract law and because of that it cannot be annulled. Therefore, whenever public laws like the Truth and Lending Act is created, it can only be formatted to align with the principles of contract like assignment rather than an attempt to override it because public laws simply work some maxims called stare decisis. Stare decisis are principles to how things work, in this case, contract. An assignment is one of those principles of contract. When you hear that term right and obligation of contract within the Constitution, this phrase right here. In Article 2, Section 10, no state shall pass any bill of attainder or law impairing obligation of contract. By the foundational principles, that act as a big bang to all the other public laws, the big bang being the constitutional, which is the core of them all. According to that, they cannot pass any laws that impairs the obligation of contract. Because this constitution knows that there's something called assignment, something called novation, so on and so forth, and many other things, aka many other rights many other ways to which you can carry out something and most third parties know this in any given contract but do you the one entering into that contract do you know these principles of contract there are twins when it comes to third parties being involved in any type of contractual matter there are novation and assignment they're similar but not quite assignment is 9-102, section 25, I believe. Consumer obligor means an obligor who is an individual who incurred the obligation as part of transaction entered into primarily for personal, family, or household purpose. When you look at the term of consumer being a natural person, they would tell you that we use this exact term, personal, family, or household. But a consumer, nonetheless, is one who incurred obligation meaning you are a debtor if you are a consumer or an obligor. And then they're kind enough to give you an isolated definition of obligor. And guess where that hyperlink takes you? When you click on it, it takes you to 60, quote, original debtor. So the term obligor or term consumer is just another cute, fancy word for debtor. Moving on. In contrast to assignment, which is the issue people are facing in today's world, it's truly lack of knowledge. You can be as religious as you want, or you can call yourself SDC all you want, or you can call yourself a more all you want, or you can say black power, or you can call yourself none of that and still have a conceited state of mind as to what you think you are, what you identify yourself with. The reality remains that there is a lot going on on a logical, very, very, very left brain method of contract law that is occurring right in front of you in pen and paper. And that thing that occurred in pen and paper is acting as an invisible string that is controlling your life. Almost like someone is sending a spiritual attack to you just through pen and paper. They even call your signature seals. No different than you would use blood or chlorophyll from plants to write on young sheepskin parchment papers to create seals and bury it and things like that. They are doing this exact same thing with just regular ink and then you put your signature on it, then they begin to sell that and assign it in a way that doesn't even align with how the assignment principles work. It does not even align with how novation principles work. 
But if you, the one being taken advantage of, don't even know what assignment is in the first place, don't even know what novation is in the first place, how do you even know which you're looking at right in front of you, which they always send you letters, or you've signed it at some point and you even have copies of it? Usually that copy that you have is not even the right copy that they're actually using on the back end. If you don't know any of this, how can you ever even begin to even see that the world you live in is actually truly a lie? Beyond just going on about some need to complain, some need to point fingers. Actually know the intricate details like these. Actually know the principles behind it. If you know the principles behind it, then you know what's wrong with it. And then you know what to bring up and contend as different counts when you sue people. Or before you do that, you set up your initial procedure as far as possible. So let's just say the assignment was proper under the presumption that you should sign it. Well, where was the consideration? There was none. So you see, no matter what turn they try to take, it's all gone. And you also see that there's really not much they can do if you know what you're doing. And you also see that the whole issue of people trying to say they're trading on your credit or stock market, that's not the proper way to go. Unless you have a very specific audit that shows so many details, then you can't even begin to talk about that. Unless you really know how markets work when it comes to stocks and interest and shares. You can't even begin to talk about that because most people don't even know crap about that. Because there are principles in that world also. That makes it work a certain way that you have to evoke for you to even begin to talk about, oh, they're using my credit to trade in the stock market. How is it your credit if you don't even have equitable interest in it? When all that exists, the evidence that you're dead or true, that promissory note. So if you start going the route of saying, oh, they're using my credit to trade in the market, and because of that, I'm going to use that as a reason to try to rescind or try to sue them, you're going the completely opposite route of where you're supposed to be going. Another rhetoric that highly misleads people that people go on about when it comes to this mortgage and note crap is the fact that they say if you split the note, it invalidates the contract or the liability. The mortgage itself is the terms and condition. The note itself is what creates the monetary obligation. And the mortgage, which is the terms and condition, lets you know that they can be enforced separately. The mortgage is a separate document. The promissory note is a separate document. UCC 9 deals with mortgages. UCC 3 deals with notes. You have to really understand that people don't know these things. Where they get this rhetoric and this contention that if the mortgage and note are split, it's voided because they're supposed to stay together, they can't tell you where or show you where. Yet, Naturally, from the origin, those two instruments, according to the terms and condition called the mortgage, would lays out how the contract works and the obligations to that note. That mortgage itself always has a clause that says we can do anything with this note separate from the mortgage. The mortgage is just a type of preemptive lispendence. Lispendence means a pendant suit to sort of mark up the interest of ownership that's filed along with the, the complete 30 minute video is posted on the Patreon page. Take care, best of luck.